Hey everyone, guess what? What? Paradise After Dark will be featured in the month of November in the True Crime Calendar. There's a True Crime Calendar? Yes. You can order it on podcastcalendars.com and use our promo code PARADISE for 10% off. There's also a pre-sale going on from now until November 30th for an additional 10% off. That is awesome. You know what? That would make an awesome Christmas gift. I know, right? Christmas is coming. So everyone, podcastcalendars.com and use code PARADISE. Hi, everyone. Hello. I'm Lauren. I am Ken. And this is Paradise After Dark. Duck, 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 duck. Paradise After Dark is an independent podcast covering true crime. Unsolved mystery. Missing people. Urban legends. And some creepy places. If you'd like to support our show and get a bunch of extra Paradise After Dark content, please consider signing up for our Patreon at patreon.com backslash Palmahawk Media. That's P-A-L-M-A-H-A-W-K Media. And be sure to check out our website, ParadiseAfterDark.com. Yeah, on the website, you'll find links to all of our episodes, even the archived ones, mailing lists, merch store, links to our social medias, and of course, our Patreon. And at our website, we also have a little tip jar, so if you just want to help out the show once, you can swing on by there and drop some coins in the tip jar. We'd really appreciate it. We'll also give you a shout out on the show. That's right. I mean, a shout out on the show. So, Lauren, tonight we have a missing persons case. A missing persons case, yes. We're going to be talking about Tiffany Daniels out of Pensacola, Florida. Tiffany Daniels was born March 11, 1988 in Dallas, Texas, to parents Cindy and Rodney Daniels. Her family moved to Pensacola when she was young, and this is where she basically grew up. She attended Pensacola State College and the University of West Florida after graduating from Pensacola High School. Her family describes her as free-spirited, and she could often lift the mood of those around her simply with her presence. She was very open and trusting. She enjoyed painting and eventually took a job at Pensacola State College in the theater department where she painted sets. She enjoyed biking and hiking in the dunes, and she was a pescatarian, eating vegetarian foods but still including seafood. And at 4.43 p.m. on August 12th of 2013, Tiffany left her job as a theater technician at the Pensacola State College in Pensacola. That was the last time anyone seen or heard from her. Before Tiffany disappeared, she was having some financial problems. Her parents said that in the summer of 2013, they noticed she had a pattern of paying the rent for roommates that were unable to pay their share. In July of 2013, after another roommate had moved out, she advertised on Craigslist for a new roommate. Gary Nichols, a 54-year-old father of one of her friends who was separating from his wife, wanted to live close to his job. So he answered Tiffany's ad and moved in. Tiffany's parents were uneasy about her sharing living quarters with a man more than twice her age, but he was able to pay his share of the bills, and the two had similar interests. Gary, too, liked cycling and following a similar diet. On August 11th of 2013, Tiffany had a farewell breakfast for her boyfriend. Now, he had been accepted into the graduate robotics program at the University of Texas in Austin. Now, her roommate recalls that she was slightly depressed for the rest of the day. That night, she and Gary decided to watch Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Now, this is the film on which the musical she was painting sets for at her work was based. Now, he said after the movie, the two went to their bedrooms as they both had to work the next morning. And sometime between 3 and 5 a.m., Gary recalled that he heard the door to the house open and close several times. He also remembered hearing footsteps. And he looked outside from his room, thinking it was Tiffany, but he didn't see her. Now, he had said that he got up later and left for work around 7 a.m. and Tiffany's car was gone. And Tiffany did not need to be at work until 8 a.m. And according to her family, she was not an early riser. Her father had even said if she had to be somewhere at 9, she would most likely leave her house at 8.50. Well, she is reported to have arrived to work on time that day, although at some point she asked her supervisor if she could leave a little early 
and let him know that she would be taking some time off, possibly the whole week, but did not explain why, other than that she had things she had to take care of. Due to her computer's internet history, it is believed that Tiffany did come home after work around 5 p.m. She was believed to have been there until around 7 p.m. Gary stated that he was home during this time, but he did not see Tiffany or hear her because he was on the phone with his girlfriend. That night, Gary grew concerned when she had not returned home by 10 p.m. and was not returning his calls. He called his daughter, Noelle, Tiffany's friend, who told him not to worry as she was an adult and might want to hang out with friends closer to her age. He agreed with her and went to bed. She had not returned by the following morning, the 13th, and was still not returning his calls. That evening, he returned and found that the electricity to the house had been turned off. The electric bill was in Tiffany's name. He again called his daughter to inform her that Tiffany had still not returned. This time, he suggested she get in touch with her parents, which she did via a private Facebook message. Noelle and Tiffany's mother, Cindy, soon began contacting a list of Tiffany's friends that they knew of. None had seen her all week either. And by the end of the week, they realized it was time to call the police and report her missing. Cindy, her mother, initially went to the Escambia County Sheriff's Office, which seemed to be dismissive of this case. Now, they were dismissive most likely because Tiffany was an adult that lived on her own and could come and go whenever. We hear of this quite often in these types of disappearances, where an adult gets reported missing and the Sheriff's Office looks at it as, well, they're grown. So, the Sheriff's Office takes the information that Cindy gave them, but again, they seem to believe that her daughter had gone out partying and would turn up soon, but because Tiffany had been living in the city of Pensacola and was last seen there, the Escambia County Sheriff's Office referred the case to the Pensacola Police Department, or the PPD for short, and the detective there understood Cindy's concern, and they were actually eager to get involved. Well, that's good. Within a few days following her disappearance, her roommate Gary decided to move out. He gave his key to Cindy, who did not previously have a key to her daughter's home. Although Gary was looked at as a suspect by some, he was ruled out as being part of any wrongdoing that led to Tiffany's disappearance. On August 18th, Cindy met with Detective Daniel Harnett of the PPD at Tiffany's house and searched it. Now inside, they found Tiffany's camping gear and concluded that it did not appear that she was planning any type of trip or outing. And the police... They, after searching the house, found no signs of foul play. Now, picture this. During this entire search and the wait, Cindy was made to wait outside. And you can just imagine that being the worst feeling ever. Yeah. So waiting to see what the detectives have found, she had to actually wait for the detective to show up because he requested that she not go inside until he gets there. Right. So she was waiting. So just that, that anxiety of waiting for the detective and then having to wait outside the whole time and not being able to go in had to be gut-wrenching as a mother. Yes. When Detective Harnett learned that Tiffany's boyfriend had left Pensacola the day before, he began exploring that angle. The boyfriend had called Tiffany upon his arrival in Austin on the 11th, but not at all on the 12th. He was cooperative and provided fingerprints and DNA samples, and his cell phone records showed he had indeed been in Austin, the Austin area, all weekend. Harnett also considered Tiffany had been depressed over her boyfriend's move. Well, this was coupled kind of with her money troubles and the unpaid bills. So he began to consider that she may have harmed herself. But she had plans for the immediate future. Besides the trip to Austin she planned to visit her boyfriend, she had also planned a dance in two weeks' time. Okay, that makes sense. It didn't seem like she would have taken her own life or started a new one somewhere else. The weekend after. Tiffany disappeared, the news media reported on it, and her friends and family distributed these flyers on the street. Now, these flyers included a picture of her tattoos on her feet that we mentioned earlier, as these would have been rather distinctive and would be easily remembered if someone had seen them. Uh, We're going to post pictures on social media so you can see these tattoos. They're very distinctive. Yep. So on August 20th, this is eight days after her disappearance, a jogger who also happened to be a friend of Tiffany's family recognized her vehicle. This was the gray Toyota 4Runner SUV. It was in a parking lot in the Pensacola Beach. Now, residents in the area said the car had only been there for maybe two days. Other residents said they had seen a man getting out of the car earlier that day. Inside the car was her bicycle, her purse, cell phone, wallet, some clothes, some paintings, a jug of water, 
and a jar of peanut butter. Now, the contents of her car kind of leads me to believe that it was parked there by Tiffany. It would seem to me that anyone trying to hide or ditch her car would have removed the contents. This would make it more difficult to come up with any leads, right? Would you agree with that? I mean, you would want to take the contents out of the car and not leave them in there. Well, I guess it would just depend on what big of a hurry you were in or what the situation was. I guess that makes sense. It would just seem to me that if you were trying to hide the car, if someone had done something with Tiffany and parked the car Well, it's there. not like they're not going to figure out it's her car by the plate number. Well, I understand that, but I'm saying the contents, you would want to get everything out of the car, clean it, maybe get rid of fingerprints, things like that. You would be scared that there'd be something left in the car. But again, I'm not very, I'm not a detective. I'm just Ken. That's it. I'm just Ken. So needless to say, the car was towed by the police department and they take this to the police garage and they begin the examination of the car. Investigators found two fingerprints that could not be matched to Tiffany or any of the investigators who had worked on the car. One on the door handle and the other one was on the steering wheel. At the police garage, investigators found sand on the bicycle tires, but none on the car's floorboards. This suggested to Harnett the possibility that Tiffany could have gone for a bike ride at the beach that evening and that she might have decided to go for a swim afterward. A friend of hers noted that a meteor shower was happening at the time, which he said was the sort of thing she might have decided to watch on the beach. If she had, it was possible she had drowned. However, no body was found on the shore, and Harnett said it was usually common for a victim to wash up after drowning. Yeah, he said that they usually don't always show up exactly where they were swimming, because it's the golf and the current can take them out or something to that effect. But they show up somewhere someone would have yeah. found Tiffany. Now, what we do know is Tiffany's plates were scanned on the toll bridge leading to the beach on August 12th. And Detective Harnett examined the security footage from the toll bridge at Bob Sykes Bridge. Now, this is the only road connection between Pensacola and the island. And it did show that the forerunner had passed through the tolls at exactly 7.51 p.m. on August 12th. Now, mind you, this is four hours after she left work, or roughly four hours after she had left work, and we know she went home. Now, again, this is the same exact evening that Tiffany disappeared. But what they could not determine from the footage is if it was actually Tiffany driving the car or not. It didn't show a face. All it showed was, in fact, her car was there, her plate was there, but that's all we have. So let's take a quick break, and we'll come back with... The weekend after the car was found, Class Kids, an organization founded in 1994 by Mark Class after the kidnapping and murder of his 12-year-old daughter, Polly Hannah Class, in Petaluma, California, in coordination with local police and the U.S. National Park Service, which has jurisdiction over the national shoreline, searched much of the island with humans and search dogs. A few random fragments of clothing and jewelry were found, but none belonging to Tiffany. With all these searches and investigative procedures in Pensacola exhausted, no further physical evidence was likely. Now, Class Kids, is a, this is a very organized group. They use these high-tech search procedures, including digital tracking, and they do all this to ensure that they have covered every inch of an area and left no stone unturned. So they literally track everyone who's in the search party. And if they look and see an area where there was someone that maybe they didn't miss, where there's like 15 or 20 feet, they can go back and check that area. It's very, very, very sophisticated equipment. So what basically what you're saying is if class kids missed or didn't find anything, that there probably wasn't anything anything. there to find. Exactly. And and you find those those search groups, like you have EquiSearch and there's there's several others um, who – these are – these are organizations that came about after horrible things occurred. So that's one of those good things come from bad things. Right. Now, Tiffany's family was proceeding with their determination. So they decided to set up a Facebook page called Help Find Tiffany. Now, this was to further the search. And they, in doing so, they found themselves busy sorting through many, many tips that initially poured in. Now, one tip came from a convenience store clerk who said he saw her in Pensacola just a few days after she went missing. Now, this tip seemed credible at first. As the clerk described Tiffany's foot tattoos, which we talked about earlier, were very distinctive. Now, although the security footage from the store failed to corroborate this account, 
They sat there and looked through all the footage and never found Tiffany. Walked through the door, no checkout, nothing to confirm this particular sighting of Tiffany. That's strange, though, if the clerk actually described her tattoos, which are said to be very unique. Well, keep in mind, they are on all of the flyers and everything that's out yeah, there. Yeah, that's true. And remember, people like to just be part of it. Yes. So several months after Tiffany's disappearance, in January of 2014, a woman who worked as a waitress at a restaurant outside New Orleans reported that shortly after the disappearance, she had seen a woman matching Tiffany's description come in with two other women, one roughly the same age and the other older, possibly Latina and more nicely dressed. The younger women behaved strangely, both wearing long sleeve shirts despite the warm weather, with the cuffs pulled over their hands and never looking at the waitress in the eye. She said they seemed to let the older woman do the talking for the group. When the waitress told one of the younger women, she looked like that woman who had been reported missing in Florida. The group got up and left. Slightly suspicious. Unfortunately, the restaurant's security cameras had been taped over since that date of since the date of the encounter, and thus it was impossible to find any documentary confirmation of the waitress's story. Tiffany's parents strongly believed this was her for two reasons. First was that putting the sleeves over her hands was something Tiffany frequently did when she was cold. Second, the waitress recalled that the woman who resembled Tiffany had asked whether one of them had used fish broth instead of chicken. Cindy recalled a similar incident when she had been eating out with her daughter and the restaurant had substituted chicken broth and Tiffany could taste the difference as she was a pescatarian and normally avoided chicken-based products. So this all leads Tiffany's family to fear that she had not left Pensacola voluntarily. Now, they began researching human trafficking as a possible explanation for Tiffany's disappearance. They saw possible similarities between Tiffany's case and that of another woman who had recently been drugged and abducted from nearby Panama City and taken to New Orleans by two men who told her she was to work as a prostitute. Now, this may have been the woman thought to originally be Tiffany that was seen in the restaurant. Yeah. We don't know this information. Now, while traffickers prefer to target women in their late teens, this is according to the experts, they will occasionally attempt to abduct women closer to Tiffany's age. Now, her parents believe she would have been trusting enough to fall for whatever pretext they used to approach their daughter. She was a very free spirit, very helpful she was very, very trusting and very easy to get along with, very easy to talk to. Now, Interstate 10, which passes through Pensacola and New Orleans, has been described as one of the major trafficking routes in the U.S. This goes from like Florida all the way to like San Diego or Sacramento. I don't remember the, the ending, but it goes all the way to California. Yeah. This is a, a basically it's a gigantic. It's a major artery from exactly. east to west. Exactly. So Detective Harnett, remember he's the head detective on this case, he said that he has found no evidence to support the trafficking theory, now, although he qualifies that by saying police have ruled nothing out at this point. So he's saying he's, it's not likely that that's the case, They're but they're not ruling it out completely. It's just not something they're focusing on. Well, just a little tidbit. At the time of Tiffany's disappearance, the National Human Trafficking Resource Center said Florida was third in the number of calls received by the center's human trafficking hotline. Whoa, yeah. So Florida is a hotbed for trafficking, and that hasn't changed. That's still the case to this day. Do we know which state was number one? Maybe Texas, probably. Probably Texas. I remember at CrimeCon in Austin, there were tons of signs in the bathroom, restrooms, airports, restaurants. It's not just Austin, though. When I went to – when I went to Dallas – Oh, the same Dallas thing. Fun. When yeah. I went to the True Crime Podcast Festival, in every feet, in every woman's bathroom, inside the stall, there's a there's a little sign. You know, if you're being held against your will, or you can call this line, you can text this number. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Is I don't think it's necessarily just Austin. I think it's all of Texas. I think Texas is the hottest bed, and obviously because you've got quick access to Mexico, you've got quick access. You know, you're kind of more centrally located in the South. And once you get out of Texas, it's not just Mexico. I mean, it's all of Central and South America as well. So, you know, just things to consider when you're traveling. 
just be diligent. And that's why I believe, but of course, Florida being in the South and close to the interstate 10 area where you can get back and forth, it makes sense why they would look at that. But I'm sure that Harnett was hard on this case and was able to say, okay, look, we've, we've gone down that road. We're not going to rule it out completely, but we have enough information to say, Hey, that's probably not what happened in this case. Now, with all the tips that led in, remember the Facebook page, we're going to go to early of August 2015 when someone contacted Cindy through the Facebook page and said they would give information on Tiffany's location in exchange for money. Remember, people always try to go for that, I know. that, that money grab. It's awful. Now, the message that Cindy received said they had information on where Tiffany's body was and who actually harmed Tiffany. Now, a woman had claimed that her ex had admitted to killing Tiffany and that she actually had audio proof of him confessing to this. Now, when Cindy asked for evidence before she had over any money, a recorded clip was actually sent to her. And of course, with the help of the Internet, investigators were able to determine that the claims were fake, but it was not easy on the family at all. No. I mean, they received this information and it's just not easy on them because... They listened to it, and it was believable, but there was actually an audio match to actually somebody confessing at a trial. And that really – because they were really into this. And obviously, we're reading this in short time, but this was a span of time between they got the information. They were able to figure out what it actually was. So there was a span of time where they really believed that they had information on where Tiffany was. Wow. Well, later in 2015, they did get some good news when the Investigation Discovery, or ID, cable network decided to revive its series, Disappeared, which profiles missing persons cases, and Tiffany's case was going to be one of them. Tiffany's mother said, I'm hoping they'll bring some awareness into Pensacola for other families, too. We, unfortunately, do have more stories here of disappeared people that they could really highlight and maybe get some closure for other families too. The crew from ID went to Pensacola, filmed locations associated with the case and reenactments, and interviewed Harnett, Tiffany's parents, sister, and some of her friends who had helped with the investigation. Tiffany's parents said it was much more difficult than they had expected, revisiting a lot of their daughter's old stomping grounds with the crew, watching reenactments of Tiffany's life, Although they had high hopes that it would have been, that it would make a big impact on the case. The hour long episode aired on April 18th, 2016. If you'd like to watch it, it's episode two of season seven. The episode is titled Against the Tide. After the filming of Disappeared, but before it aired, the first new evidence in the case since the original investigation surfaced. In December of 2015, after news coverage of the case's second anniversary four months earlier, a citizen had come forward and told police that on the day Tiffany's car was discovered, he had seen a man in his 30s wearing red shorts and no shirt opening the car's tailgate, a report consistent with the two witnesses who said they saw a man leave the car after it was parked there. A witness remembered this because the car had been parked unusually, facing oncoming traffic, and was in an area reserved for wildlife. But sadly, nothing came of this new evidence. And Tiffany's family and friends continued to participate in walks to bring awareness to their missing daughter as well as others missing from the area. The family uses their experience to help other people who may have you know, friends or family that have fallen victim to human trafficking. I mean, they host educational programs about the dangers and prevalence of human trafficking, and they just, they're just involved in the community to help. Yeah. So they've also taken out ads in the Pensacola News Journal with her picture and pictures of her tattoos to keep her face out there for continued awareness. And keep in mind, these tattoos are very distinct. We'll, we'll post pictures, like we said. Yeah. Just that's why you keep hearing this come up because they're very distinct and a great identifier. Now, at the time of her disappearance, Tiffany was five foot seven inches and had blue eyes, blonde hair. She had tattooed four images again, top her feet showing a plant's growth and blooming. And these are like little seeds and they're growing, which says a lot about Tiffany. I mean, she was up and coming. She was growing. She was, she was definitely a seed of the earth. I mean, she was a very earthy type person. 
Now, it was last reported that Tiffany's car does remain in police impound lot. Its contents are actually still intact. And in, they do this in case any new information comes to light, which might be relevant in the case. Now, to this day, the circumstances of Tiffany's disappearance remains unclear and her case is currently classified as missing and her case remains unsolved. So, in this case, there's so many facets to this case regarding what may have happened to Tiffany. Now, did she leave home to start over? Was she depressed and take her own life? So, it was a suicide situation? Was she in the wrong place at the wrong time? I mean, we, we don't know, but... What we do know is that every path we took leads us to believe that if Tiffany could reach out to her family, she would have. And I don't, I don't buy the dr- accidental drowning or the suicide angle because I think that her body would have been found. I, th- unfortunately, from what I know about this case, I feel that she was taken. I don't know if it was trafficking or some other nefarious reason, but that's just my gut instinct. Well, there's one there's one thing that I actually found about this case. Now, I found it um, looking into, you know, just things about Tiffany. And I actually found it, um, it was in some show notes from Brain Scratch, who covered this like in 20, I forget what year it was. Like four I love years Brain ago. Scratch. Yeah, we met him at Crime Gun. He's a great guy. He bought me a drink. Love that guy. The reason I, I, I kind of bring this up is in his, in his research, he found that Tiffany had um, – Basically, been part of this group called Couch Surfing. Now, I looked at the show notes, and I want to bring this up because what what I want to put on here is the Couch Surfing thing is like if you want to go to a different country, it, it's like an Airbnb but for free. What you do is you put your stuff on there, and you say, "Hey, I want to go to this country," and you put your profile up there, and somebody says, "Hey, who's coming? Who who's coming from here? Going to stay here?" So you can have someone come into your town stay with you and you can go out with them, show them different things. And this was the type of person that she was. And just, just to give you an idea um, of the type of person that Tiffany was, she literally has this couch surfing thing and she has visited Florence, Italy, and she did the couch surfing and she actually hosted the couch surfing. So one of the things that I'm concerned with is maybe someone that she had been involved with during the couch surfing, maybe they revisited and contacted her. We don't know. But one thing I do want to read here is it talks about her philosophy. And basically, the about me, it says, I'm a theater technician. I'm very easygoing and enjoy fun company. Saturday nights, I go swing blues, swing blues, dancing. Now, my philosophy. So I will list the most recent one I have come upon because it makes the question more approachable. Today at the beach, I came to the conclusion that it is good to bring something like a Frisbee. Two paddles and a ball, whatever, etc. Bring those with you when you are heading to the beach. Even if you don't speak the same language with someone, Frisbee has its own. So this tells you the type of free spirit she was, that she would talk to anyone. You did, if she didn't understand what you were saying, she would still try to communicate with you somehow. Yeah. And that's something that, it's a great thing, but it could also be a dangerous thing. Yeah. So just something to consider. She was such a beautiful spirit, uh, easygoing. And it sounds to me, and if you go to the Couch Surfing website and look up Tiffany Daniels, her profile, you will really see that she was just an amazing individual who was sort of outgoing and wanted to experience life and help others experience life. So I, I think that's... That's pretty much it for tonight, Lauren. Yeah. If you have any information about Tiffany's disappearance, please contact the Pensacola Police Department at 850-435-1900 or go to helpfindtiffany.com. And if you suspect someone is a victim of human trafficking, the best thing you can do is stall the person if you're in a position to do so such as a cashier or a waiter waitress, and contact the authorities immediately by either calling 911 or the National Human Trafficking Hotline at 1-888-373-7888. If you are unable to stall them, try to see which direction they go, where they're headed, and what type of vehicle they're in, and obviously try and get a plate number. Now, I'm going to put all this information into the show notes as well, so you can refer back to it. 
We're not saying that Tiffany Daniels was trafficked. It's just a good, a good reminder. That it's a possibility. That it's a possibility. And if you suspect it, this is what you need to do. Absolutely. And if you want to know more information or get some of the family's views on this, also be sure to visit Facebook and go to Help Find Tiffany. Currently, they have like 23,000 followers. Yeah. So there's information on there. There's pictures. Again, it, it's all the information that you'll find. And sometimes it helps to just follow these pages because if they get enough followers, then that stuff gets put out there. Right. And then it gives you some more information. So yeah. we know that most people that are listening to this podcast and listen to True Crime Podcast, you know, if you want to be involved, sometimes just be knowledgeable of the situation. You don't have to get involved, but knowledge of the situation is helpful to everyone because then you're on the lookout and you can help others be on the lookout. Right. So Lauren, I guess that's going to be it for tonight. So uh, everyone. Again, if you'd like to support the show, please subscribe to our Patreon at patreon.com. Backslash Palmahawk Media. That's P A L M A H A W K Media. And again, check out our website for links to all of our social media, our merch store, and much, much more. And please make sure to subscribe to the show on whatever platform you're listening and rate and review. This really helps us branch out and reach a wider audience. And everyone, the hoodies are so comfortable. I just got one. Oh, I'm <laughs> so excited to wear it. I can't wait for it to cool off. Oh, my God, everyone. Thank you very much for listening to Paradise After Dark. Dark, 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 dark.